to be where it's at. Here's a hot spot, <clears throat> a typical hot spot. And in some cases, it will flow to the surface and cause a flood basalt. Uh, and that happens to be the case in India. And on other cases, it might just pop up to the surface and form volcanoes. And that's the way Hawaii uh, islands were born with these various in, uh, intrusions into the plate into the uh, crust. So here we go with the Deccan Plateau. Notice that in this particular case, it flows over the uh, country of India uh, and it filled in this part of India and then it gradually sloped, sloped down or sloped out, you to say, into this area below. An example of flood results is also in the United States here, which might be of some interest, and that is the Columbia Plateau is also one of those flood basalts. Looking at that a little closer, this is the Columbia Plateau. So now we're in the United States. Now we got to get back to India. But at any rate, you get a little feel as to where this basalt is in the United States. Now, the result of these flood basalts, okay, it is 6,000 500 feet thick in multiple layers. So as trying to find it, power. it occurred between 60 and 68 million years ago during the Cretaceous period. Between many of the layers are found fossil beds in sedimentary layers. There, uh, to give you a little time, it is in this period of times. Um, Cretaceous period in the Mesozoic area that the I'm trying to get something could go that this occurred. Okay. No. There you get a chance to see. Oops. How do I get rid of this? It's still visible and I don't know how to get that off. Okay. I gotta get it down. Uh, why am I having this trouble? Oh, I got somebody. <laughs> Let's go ahead and reshare your screen. Do you want to yeah. share your screen? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's okay. I'm going to go back to here. All right. There I go. know. See, there we go. How do I get rid of this stops? part in here. Oh, That's okay. That's really the best we can do. Okay. Stay. All right. Okay, now you had a chance to see this layering going on between the basalt and some of the limestone that was poured into it. Okay. Well, now we get to another part of that's famous for India in this area, and that's the monsoons. To know India is to, and her people, one has to know the monsoon. To the people of India, the monsoons are a source of life. Very true. Several reversal, seasonal reversal of winds is what happens. Uh, general onshore movement in the summer, I'll show you in a moment, general offshore flow in the winter. Very distinctive seasonal precipitation regime. And it does rain very much. Let's look at, this is the summer one. Notice that the winds are coming from the south and they are attracted toward the low pressure that is in the middle of Asia. And that brings in the water from the ocean. Then in the winter, it turns around because this becomes the high pressure in, the, uh, in Asia and it flows the other direction. And as a consequence, um, there is some water that uh, rain that does occur during the winter as well. 
and that may be shown here in a moment. This is the summer. Notice that the winds are hitting this area of the Western Ghats, but it also goes right on up the Ganges River Basin. And uh, that brings a lot of moisture up into that area and especially into Bangladesh as well. A little uh, sharper picture of it shows the winter as it's moving around and notice this area here is getting uh, quite a bit of rainfall, so it's, is Sri Lanka in this area. Um, let's make that a little bit bigger and notice that in the summertime, this is the area that gets the moisture and so does this one. And it moves right on up through to the top. Okay. A quick picture of the monsoons. And notice that there's about 115 inches of rain for the year. When does it fall? Well, here's June and July, and then it's a little bit more in August and so forth, in, uh, all the way through October. However, this is the time when the winter monsoons comes along and you hardly get any rain at all. So you have a feeling that it really comes in in one particular time. Uh, a quick picture shows you where this is probably um, mm -hmm. There we go. Getting, getting rid of some of this here, okay. Uh, notice that this is the area where a great deal of rainfall comes and so does it here in the Assam. So that gives you a little bit of picture of where the moisture does arrive. Potentially, uh, potentially negative effects of the monsoons. Results of catastrophic rainfall, widespread flooding, property damage, destruction to agricultural lands, damage to transportation infrastructure, homelessness, disease, malnutrition. So it's a problem serious injury and even death. And here is a picture of that. Uh, the monsoon drains caused this mudslide in Malin village near Pune, July 30, 2014. 41 people were swept away and many were injured. 41 were uh, died in that mudslide in that particular time. Pretty good picture of the mudslide. India encompassed three-fourths of the South Asia's total area. 28 percent urbanized. 14 major and numerous minor languages. The lingua franca. What is it? I imagine most of you have guessed already. English will be the uh, language, uh, English will be the major government language be because the British were there at one time. But now notice this map is full of different dialects, different languages. But um, the yellow one here does show Indo European family languages. Whereas this is the Davidian down here and some others alongside of it. But notice there are many different speaking languages in India. It's the most populous democracy in the world. English is the language of government. No country exhibits greater cultural diversity than India. Population, 
uh, present count. Let's look at that a moment. India is 1.25 billion. And the people reproduce at only uh, 2.55. To this is the total uh, fertile ratio. And that, of course, is 2.55 per woman. Uh, China is, has 100 or uh, 1.3 billion people, and their TFR is a little lower. So they're not reproducing or refilling the population as fast as India is. As a consequence, India with, <coughs> in, in 2019 that is, 1.3 billion, China 1.4. It, it is projected that India will pass China in 2028. Well, that's because China has one baby only, right? Okay. Uh, All right. We've got a picture here of the map just to refresh you that this is India and we're going to keep on going with that. India's infrastructure, hmm, public transportation is the primary mode for the people. Yeah, and they will do this. They will fill a train like this, not on the, only on the inside, but the outside as well. Now hang on. Or the railways themselves you are used for freight. And as you can see in this picture, considerable uh, freight is being moved on the rail, railroads. But in order to handle some of this, <clears throat> like in the city of Mumbai, you have skywalks so people can walk around and because it's so busy uh, in the street itself. Here's a nice skywalk walk around on in Mumbai. Mumbai, if you don't remember, if you don't remember why, that is the name for Bombay. Bombay is the one that I learned uh, about when I was studying years ago, grade school. I think this is a rather interesting slide insofar it does contain 50% of the world's population. And if you look at the rivers, here's the Indus River, which we'll study it later, the Ganges, and uh, the Yolong or Brahmaputra River, but then that's concerning India itself. But look next to it here in China and Indonesia. These rivers also furnish a lot of water and as a consequence, People live near the rivers. So 50% of the world's population is in this area. Okay. The Indus River drains into the Adriatic, Abrian, um, Arabian Sea, excuse me. We will notice that there are five rivers up here when we study Bangladesh or um, Pakistan later on. Notice where the uh, Ganges is. It joins with the Brahmaputra, which comes across on top of the Himalayas on down into this um, Bay of Bengal. Ganges and the Deccan Plateau drain into the Bay of this um, Bengal. Tigers. Kind of a nice little picture showing where the Northern Plains is. And of course, that's where the Ganges River happens to be. So as well as the uh, Assam over here. Okay, we'll look at something called the Tharb Desert. The Thar Desert is over here. It's a dry area, obviously, uh, in this part of India. It is it is known for its carif, uh, the, the care of summer crops. And let me show you what those are a moment. 
Here's what the desert looks like in Pakistan and India because they share part of this desert. Here are the crops, rice, maize, groundnuts, and let's see this one you can't see down here, jowar, and pulse, and cotton. They're all part of this um, Thar Desert area. Well, not all the area can grow these crops, obviously, and so this is where uh, some of the activity takes place. The nomads are in that area. Next one I want to look at is a, the Chaudhanagpur area, right in this region. That is a plateau of industrial development. Why? That's where the limestone, the mica, the bauxite, bauxite the carb, uh, copper, and the um, iron ox, iron, and coal happens to be. Let's take a look at this for a moment. Here's one of the big coal production areas in that area. The largest in the world is Ahmedabad. That's in that same plateau area. Just to become familiar once again with these, um, with the area, now take a look at the Western Ghats in this particular place and the Easterns on this side. And of course, these are higher. They're going to catch more rain when the summer monsoons come along. Nice waterfalls in the Western Ghats over the one of the escarpments. I put this in because we're going to look at elephant, elephants in just a little bit. India is home to 60% of the remaining Asian elephant population, estimated to be between 10 and 15,000. Uh, and I have a little personal interest in this one. This card uh, picture was sent on a card from my sister. My sister married an Indian. Uh, who was a uh, uh, Rhodes Scholar, and he taught at uh, Southern Cal and uh, uh, various other colleges. When he retired, the two of them went back to India at Pune to start a girls' school. Uh, actually, they took over a struggling girls' school. The, kindergarten through fifth grade. And uh, girls just did not get any education. And this was their way of giving back to the country where he came from. Elephants, yes, they're losing uh, quite a number of them. In the Western Ghats. And the Marcos Cokes are uh, prominent in the Western Ghats. Plantation, um, as far as I can tell, this must be tea. Here's a quick fact or two. The general, uh, the uh, GNI happens to be about 2020 uh, in, uh, in 2018. That was up from 1,006 per family. Mm -hmm. Well, India is home to one, one third of the poor people in the world. And we'll see that we have some rough particular places for which they live here in just a little bit too. But it has a flat, the fastest growing economy. Economic development here is in handicrafts, old and new branches of this, and the branches of industry. Okay, and this gives you a little idea that they must be in the clothing business. Multitude of support services and nuclear power. India is right on top of the modern system. The clothing industry is one of them. 
Now, <clears throat> I want to start here because we're going to get into some high tech stuff. Bangalore is right in this particular spot of India, Bangalore's city. Okay. It is known as the Silicon Valley of India. Home of most prominent world companies located <coughs> in uh, Bangalore. Okay, excuse me. Here is a picture of Bangalore. And here's one of the industries, the Oracle financial service software building in India is this one. Actually, Oracle Financial Services are uh, worldwide. I believe the headquarters are in California, but this is some kind of a building. And I imagine a few people that are listening to this uh, know about this financial services. In that same place <clears throat> uh, is the ancient palace and grounds of the Bangalore. So if I can get rid of that, the Bangalore Belt Palace. Okay. Economic development. <clears throat> A mixture of traditional village farming and modern agriculture. Here's a picture of some of it. India ranks second worldwide in farm output. That's amazing. Fresh fruits and vegetables. Thank you. Oh, Susan just brought me some water and I appreciate that. May I take a drink a minute? Ah, that's better. Fruits, vegetables are raised on small farms. <clears throat> but notice this milk um, processing plant. But they also raise cassava and bananas, but that's not all. <clears throat> Sugar cream. <coughs> oh, my. Sugar cane crusher here to uh, take care of some of the juice that they need for their festival. Interesting kinds of equipment. Much of it is on an individual basis. It's, they do have machinery in many places, but some places they don't. Field of mustard. And another way of tilling the soil. No tractor here. Some pictures of what they do raise. Here we have some coffee trees and various vegetables. And jute seems to be a very important part of the, what is raised in India. Of course, they like to make the roads out of it, which you see right here. What else do they raise? Well, uh, lots of rice. Now, rice needs lots of water. So um, during the summer monsoons, they grow it rather uh, extensively along the edges here. The green here shows the areas where rice is being uh, raised. Okay. But these other areas also are important. Here's the millet. Millet grows in the rain shadow of the Western Ghats. And wheat is uh, grown in the cooler areas of India. No. Gives you a little feel that India does produce an awful lot of food, and in fact, sometimes they do the they will export various quantities of their food depending on the year and the demand. So 
agriculture is a big business for them. Now, <clears throat> some years ago, they uh, were helped a bit, as well as other countries, in what is called the Green Revolution, the successful development of higher yield, faster growing varieties of rice, and other cereals in developing countries. Okay, India was one of those. It was the International Research Program in 1960, and they focused on the food crisis. New regulation systems, that's one. Intensive use of fertilizer. And these, this looks like one of the results. Now, this happens to be in the Punya region, but it is part of India and also of Pakistan. The Eastern Ghats are the lower ones. It's this area in here. Okay. <clears throat> Most of you probably know about India. And uh, when you look at the Ganges River, well, let's make sure we know where we are. Here is the Indus River, all right? But we're more interested in the Ganges at this point and the Brahmaputra. Notice that the Brahmaputra is on the um, leeward side of the Himalayas and actually gains its water from there and then crosses over into the Assam region. So we're looking at the Ganges and the Brahmaputra rivers. And if you can take a quick look at this, uh, it does travel nicely through that valley, just below the Himalayas. But when it gets down to this point, it starts to distribute. So you have a whole group of rivers that are fed by the Ganges and the Brahmaputra. So this distributed area then has um, yeah, many, many trails into the Bay of Bengal. And we'll notice when we look at Bangla, Bangladesh next time, how that really floods the whole area again and again. So it's a real problem to it. But let's turn now to the Ganges River, and it is the most sacred river to the Hindus. But, polluted. Gives you a little idea how polluted. Diseases are rampant. Here's a picture of November 2019. Delhi, serious pollution from fires at that time. So that's only a year ago. The Ganji is used for laundry. Mm -hmm. Come down and take your clothes and wash them up and dry them on the, on the bench, on the wall out there. That's not the only thing they do here. They bathe, they bathe here. And this happens to be uh, a city along the Ganges, the Dishara. And so they, they swim in this polluted water. Again, showing a different view of how they are in their swimming. Now, here they're taking a holy bath in this polluted water. And there's some significance to this. The sacred Ganges at this spot, Varanasi or in Benares, is a sacred place. Bathing in the Ganges, if you die here, you will go straight to heaven. I guess that may be quite an incentive for them to jump into this polluted river. And maybe because it is so polluted, they'll go to heaven quicker. Okay, some college, some big cities. Let's go through some cities. 
Mumbai, which was Bombay, 24 million. They achieved primacy based on the Suez Canal. What does the Suez Canal have to do with Mumbai? Well, well, we'll go back to that in just a minute. Delhi is the capital, it has 29 million. And then you have Calcutta or Calcutta. Calcutta was the British name. Calcutta is today's name. There's only 5 million. In Calcutta, half a million are homeless. And we'll look at that in more detail. But it was the British capital until uh, in 1772, and hence the name Calcutta. <coughs> this town was adversely uh, affected by the partitioning of India into the uh, both the um, Pakistans, and uh, we'll, we will cover next time as far as the. Uh, Pakistan's and their division is concerned. In Mumbai, take a little look at how it looks in the map, Calcutta and Delhi. Again, the picture, here we go. This is where the Delhi's are, new and old. Calcutta is on this side, in the industrial region. Mumbai is over on this side. Well, let's see, who we study first. Mumbai, which was Mumbai. This is quite the area for Mumbai. And they had to uh, reclaim some land in order to build their, their city on it. And uh, so they merged some islands together and reclaimed the the land in between the islands and built their city on it. However, now we get to that other question, what does the Suez Canal have to do with Mumbai? Well, the opening of the Su Su Suez Canal in 1869 made Bombay one of the largest seaports in Asia. And I guess you can understand if you look at this, the trip from London, of course this is a British colony, the trip from London was 12,000 miles. Over against this trip through the Suez would cut it down to 7,200 miles. And as a consequence, they landed at this part of India, making it a very important city. Here's Mumbai, it's the chief port. Wow, <clears throat> it has its modern techniques. Yeah. Or look at the slums. The slums are really bad. Dharavi is the largest slum area in Asia. But they have a nicer region here. I'm going to drink a little bit of water here. There, okay. <clears throat> so there are two different pictures of Mumbai in that way. One of the important parts of Mumbai is happens to be the temple of Moonbadavi, the goddess of Mumbai. <clears throat> but notice the British influence. Aha the oldest India cricket stadium. But this is an amazing hotel. The hotel in Mumbai, each room has its own swimming pool and green space. What does it cost to live there? Where is the swimming pool? I'd like to have you look at this edge. See that kind of blue edge there? 
all the way down. Now, if I enhance that, you see it now is a blue green, this blue edge. That is the swimming pool in each room. Well, <clears throat> how many of you are going to go there next week? Maybe they wear masks, I don't know. But this is the other side. Not nice, not nice at all. Poverty is extreme. Okay, <clears throat> we saw Dai, and I wanted to mention Agra. The uh, will come up in just a little bit, and we also saw the Varanasa where they uh, plunge into the pool. There you can go and die there you go to heaven. Okay, and here's Calcutta. Now, let's move on from there to Delhi. Okay, the parliament is in Delhi, and that is its building. You know, place is the, in Delhi, is the in, India's economic, economic hub. So there is a kind of a picture of it that you can see. But it is loaded also with temples. The actual Hardaham, the largest Hindu temple, is in New Delhi. Uh, that's not the only one. The Swaminarayan Askenhadham is known as the Temple of God. Now, that's fairly recent because it was opened in 2005. Here is an interesting, and the Yama Masad uh, is the principal mosque in Old Delhi. The towers are rather interesting. There are four towers of sandstone, but also marble. They are 40 feet high, one, two, three, four. And gives you a picture of them again. This area, this temple area, can hold 25,000 people. They can pray here at one time. An ancient one, okay, Muslim. Now, we have to go into a little bit of a background. The Mughal Empire. <clears throat> By the way, this has nothing to do with Harry Potter. Oh no, that's Mughals. The Mughal Empire. Uh, emperors of Turco-Mongol descent developed highly sophisticated mixed Persian culture. And that is in 1700, 110 to 130 million people were lived in that empire, but it declined rapidly after 1725. Question is why? Wars, agrarian crisis, famines, and so forth. Religious intolerance. I mean, Islam uh, was not being tolerated. Uh, the, and of course, British colonialism. So where does the empire go? Well, we still remember a lot of it <clears throat> in its buildings. Uh, the capital is, is at Lahore, up in this area. It's in the Ganges River Valley, awfully close to the Punjab. Uh, actually, well, actually closer to the Indus River uh, drainage area. And the Agra is where the Taj Mahal is located. This particular one, the Bad Shahi, is in Lahore. It's the largest mosque of the Mongol Empire. The Taj Mahal, well, it was a Mughal monument built by Prince Kuran, Emperor Shah Tahan in 1628. 
And you will see another picture of it. The jewel of Muslim art built by the Shah for his third wife. This came through the uh, news just the other day, Monday, in fact, September 21. It had been closed because of the virus for all this time, and now it's just been reopened. Uh, here's an old, other old building built by the Mongols. This hall of public uh, audience is built by the Mongols. It was an extension of the Personate Empire, but that building is being used yet today. India's Independence Day is celebrated in this hall every year. Well, now, Calcutta. <clears throat> Notice where it's at, down here. I don't know if you can see my little arrow, it's right in this area. It is close to the ocean and gets floods all the time. Every time a summer comes along and you get some more uh, rain monsoon, why it gets flooded. Some of you remember, let's see if I can, what's this here? Uh, Mother Teresa's home of dying people. <clears throat> Mother Teresa. She was truly compassionate to these poor people. The untouchables particularly. That's what she looks like. Teresa. Born in 1910 in Macedonia, so it's in there, she's a Greek person. Founded the Missionaries of Charity, which is really is for poverty. She went to India in 1948, but died in 1997. Not that long ago in the memory of most of us. A picture of her typical concern for the people of India. I think we got some timing quotations that uh, uh, may just apply today. And let me read them to you. People are often unreasonable and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of ulterior motives motives. Be kind anyway. If you are honest, people may cheat you. Be honest anyway. If you find happiness, people may be jealous. <laughs> be happy anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have and it may, it may never be enough. Give your best anyway. For you to see, in the end, it is between you and God. It is never between you and them anyway. Mother Teresa. Well, Kolkata. This is what it looks like on a daily basis. I'll just show you a few pictures of Calcutta. Well, I would say they are not practicing social distancing. Here's an example of what can happen here in uh, India because things happen sometimes too fast. Chennai is um, a city on the, near the Eastern Ghats. And uh, in, let's see, June 30th, 2014, this building just simply collapsed. Well, 
the construction officials were arrested because they were negligent. Uh, 29 died, 26 rescued. And that can occur when things go too fast and the code is not observed. So that's fairly recent. Oh, how many of you picked up your quiz? If you did, may I read the answers? Number one, Assam goes with easy, eastern part of Asia. Number two, Tethe C goes with its sediments became Himalayas. Number three, Union is, goes with near Madagascar. Number four, the Deccan Traps goes with steps of flood basalts. All right, the monsoons goes with T, seasonal reversal of winds. The Thar Desert, number six, goes with Baker, supports the Karnaf crops. It's number seven, Western Ghats, goes with love. Rainfall supports plantations, all right. And number eight, Eastern Ghats, eight goes with supports coffee. Vegetation and vegetables and jute. Number nine, Baron uh, says you, here. If you die, die here, go straight to heaven. And now we come to Bombay, R, Roger, and that is the Suez Canal made city big seaport. So Belkin, ooh. The Mumbai's Luxury Hotel. Number 12, the Karnat Palace is an economic hub. And Ashakabman is number 13, C, largest Hindu temple. Jama Mashad K is 2000 can pray here at one time number 15 is mother teresa d home of dying people and then we get shanae g the building collapsed all right that is the quiz now those of you got that one fine now we go into the second half of this presentation and that means there is another quiz at the end of this, but I'm not sure that got sent to you. So uh, uh, we will proceed anyway. All right. Population movement. This is kind of a general geographic statement. Cities attract, that's true. Villagers are driven off by desperate conditions because they uh, need the better conditions of a city. Hundreds of homeless then be go to the city and they sleep in the streets. And so they want to have a better life, but not necessarily getting it. To understand that a little bit, let's go into what we're known as the cultural hearths. You have to go way back in order to sign, see when they were established. And the beginnings of some of the cultural developments and population gatherings are generally along rivers. And if you notice, that is true, Indus River, Ganges River, the two that we're concerned with today is, happens to be an important part of it. But also the Yellow River, the Wangwahang River up here, and the Mesotom Mesopotamia, Tigris Euphrates River, rivers, and Nile River, they were all, uh, as well as the Niger River over here, were all part of one of the old hearths. If you go into the uh, Americas, they were not on the rivers. One was around what is today Mex Mexico City, and the other one is in uh, the Incas built in Peru. All right. 
where an early cultural emerge had developed. That's what this is. Arts and trade routes emerged from isolated tribes and villages to town and beyond. Hinduism emerged from the beliefs and practices bought uh, to India, brought to India, excuse me there, by the Indo-European Aryans, sixth century BC. Okay. Here is the one in uh, Pakistan. So we're going to briefly look at this one, but this is the Indus Valley. Hinduism is the cultural hearth there. Diffused south and east into the Ganges, that's up in here. And then it was absorbed and supplanted by earlier religious customs. Ah. Hinduism was losing favor and Buddhism was born from the discontent made the state re and they made it the state re made the state religion of India in the third century BC. That's Buddhism, Hinduism. Islam swept through Central Asia from the eighth to the 10th century. And you have a little picture here where they are. This is the area of uh, Hinduism, the yellow part. The darker part is, happens to be Islamic. And then of course you have some Buddhism coming in in this area up in Nepal and so forth, which we will look at in later. Also Sri Lanka has quite a bit of that. Now, here we go. The major tenets of Hinduism. Three main ideas are important in understanding the Hindu religion and the caste system. Aha, uh -huh. looks like there's a cow. Reincarnation. Karma. Hmm, karma. And then Dharma. Let's see once what those are. Uh oh. I'm having trouble, Susan. Are you leaning on a keyboard? No, I'm not on the key. I'm not leaning on it. Oh, there I got rid of it. Thank you. Yeah, Hinduism, there we go. Not just a religion, an intricate web of religious, philosophical, soil, economic, and artistic elements. No common creed, no single doctrine, no direct divine revelation, no rigid, narrow, or moral code, but a real belief in ancestors here. Lord uh, Sri Vishu was, is honored, and of course here he, he is with his avatars. And uh, Lord Ram is also a very important symbol for the uh, Hindus. Virtue and chivalry. They celebrate this whole thing, Hinduism, and uh, the uh, river. Uh, Amarela, well, the boat races are part of that festival. Great singing and lots of uh, festivities. This gives you a real quick picture of where the intensity of Hindus are. Uh, this particular color is 75 five to 90% Hindu. And then it gets a little thicker in some other places. Three basic practices. Puja or worship, cremation of the dead, regulation of the caste system. Hmm. Puja, Hindu worship. The worship of a god found in many homes 
Here is puja. Got to have this person over here, this God over here. Reincarnation, every living thing has a soul. When a living thing dies, its soul moves into another living creature. Oh. So, souls are reborn in a newly created life. Then there's something called Dharma. A set of rules that must be followed by all living things if they wish to work their way up the ladder of reincarnation. Don't want to be reincarnated into a pig, into a cow maybe, but otherwise. Each person's dharma is different. And if you want to find out how to have good dharma, you read this particular book, the Vedic Sankrist, a large body of Hindu texts. Every action brings about certain results. That's karma. There is no escaping the consequences of one's actions. Good behavior is rewarded when the soul is reborn into a higher ranking living creature. Karma. Now, maybe some of you have heard of karma. There's one. Well, I don't think that has anything to do with the religion. But there you go. Only 130,000 for this nice little jewel. Oh, let's go back to karma. Karma. Means to cleanse, be grateful. It's an act of love. Check with motives. Watch your attitude. Forgive. As you sow, so should, will you reap. Karma. Now look at this turning around. Let's see once. Here we go. It goes round and round. The reincarnation. Uh huh. You're born, then you're reborn and die. Well, if you've been a good boy, or a good girl, you are then are born again. And this time you are born into a different person and rebirth is, occurs. And the dance goes around and around and around. <coughs> Here's one of the Hindu gods, or uh, Durga. And this is one of the uh, temples for him. Islam entered the region through Punjab. Pakistan is Islamic. India is Hindu plus. Bangladesh is Islamic. So uh, you get this division of the religions, which is rather important. Now, Muslims declined in the continent of India. But uh, notice that in 1931, it was rather prominent. This darker red is 50, over 50%. 50 well, they gradually lost that as they went into 1951. But they're still very, very prominent. And the, this is a rather recent thing, March 20. 2020. The Indian citizenship law provides a path to citizenship for six religious groups, but not Muslims. Oh, problem. All right, a path to the citizenship for migrants who entered illegally before 2014 from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, Afghanistan, provided they belong to six religions, six of the religions, one of the six religions. Okay, what, were, what happened here? The six religions were Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Sikhism, Junism, Zoroastrianism. What notably absent was Islam. That's a problem. 
let's see what happens. There were riots, March 2020. 38 were killed in the violence, 500 were arrested in Delhi because of this new law. Riots in Delhi after the passage of the law against Islam. Well, let's look at those two religions just a moment. Islam, monotheistic. Oh, Hinduism, polytheistic. No idols under Islam, many under Hinduism. One sacred book under Islam, many writings under Hinduism. Uniform dogma under Islam, varying beliefs under Hinduism. Let's look at Islam for just a moment. Faith in one God, Muhammad. Prayer five times a day. Alms giving, 2.5% of your savings. Fasting during Ramadan. The Hajj uh, pilgrimage to Mecca is important. Okay, those are the five. Contrast continued. Islam intolerant of other religions. Hinduism has absorbed other religions. Yeah, you can eat beef here, venerated the cows on this side. Sacrifice cows, okay, that's okay. Uh, you bury the dead, here you burn the dead and alive. Wow. Islam, social equality. Hinduism, caste system. All right, this was in a social equality in theory. Theocratic society, state of secondary importance. That's what the state is just not as important. Caste percentages, lower caste, 15%. Backward class or one up is 40%. Upper Brahmins, 18%. Hinduism binds country together. Centripetal force is in, uh, sometimes involved. Gandhi, Nehru, and Indra Gandhi were important people in this uh, whole binding of them together. Let's look at this just a moment in this caste system. The Brahmas were the rulers, and then you go on down the priests, the soldiers, the artisans, the merchants, the peasants, and finally the untouchables down here. Here were the unskilled workers, and here were the skilled workers. That's quite a caste system. This guy, he's wondering, He's looking for tech support. This tech support person says she hopes I'm of a caste she can talk to. Aha, uh -huh, we can't talk to each other. Okay. The origins and spread of Buddhism. Siddhartha Gautama was born in 500 BC. He, the Emperor Ashoka in the third century, okay? He was the prince, Siddhartha, born 2,500. Years ago, gave a princely position and sought salvation and enlightenment through religious meditation. He rejected earthly desires. Buddhism. The inheritance subjected to harsher feature, features of Hinduism. Focused on knowledge, especially self-knowledge. Elimination of worldly desires. Determination not to hurt or kill people or, or, or people or animals or animals. Here we go, the Eightfold Path. Okay. To get to the right view, 
the right view, the right intentions, the right speech, the right actions, the right livelihood, the right effort, the right con concentration, and the right mindfulness. That's what's important in the Hindu religion. Oh, another little cartoon. I'm sorry, but that will not help you find the Eightfold Path. I'm trying to get the, the GPS out. Buddhism. Again, resist evil, free your mind of evil, work for the good of others, respect life. Control your thoughts, practice mediation, meditation, uh, say nothing to hurt others and know the truth. This is Buddhism. The right speech leads to understanding. The understanding leads to wisdom. Right livelihood leads to sharing. Right mindfulness leads to purposeful living. Right aspiration leads to divine inclination. Right behavior leads, leads to good will. Right absorption leads to unity. Right effort leads to highest income. Uh huh. There. How about Four Noble Truths? Sorrowing and suffering are part of all life. People suffer because they desire things they cannot have. Hmm. The way to escape suffering is to end desire by to stop wanting. Oh, that's quite a theory. And to reach a stage of not wanting. And to end desire, follow the middle path. That is the path that avoids the extremes of too much pleasure and desire. Buddhism died a natural death in India. A slow and silent observation. Uh, absorption by Brahman to Brahmanism, mostly indifference to the people. Buddhism was split into two branches. The Theravada Buddhism is found in Sri Lanka, and that's what we will look at next time for briefly, anyway. The, Mahaya, the Mahayana Buddhism is found in the Himalayas and East Asia. There's Mr. Buddha. The fall of Buddhism on the continent. Hinduism, broad and tolerant, accepted many of the teachings of Buddha. Buddhists in India, willing to compromise with the belief and customs of Hinduism. The fall of Buddhism, the final blow in the eighth century was the arrival of Islam destroyed the great Buddhist monasteries, burned libraries, killed monks. Today, only one million Buddhists live in India. Okay, here's some amazing facts about India as we finish this off. This guy, Vinar Dham, invented the Pentium clip chip. 90% of today's computers run on it. He was born in Pune, moved to Caltech, part of the Silicon Valley. Oh, here's another one. Sabir Bahatia, co-founder of Hotmail, along with Jack Smith. He grew up in Bangalore and Pune. 38% of the doctors in the USA are Indian. 12% of the scientists in the USA are Indians. 36% of the NASA, uh, NASA scientists are Indians. 34% of Microsoft employees are Indians. 28% of IBM employees are Indians. 17% of Intel scientists are Indians. 13% of Xerox employees are Indians. The famous board game chess was invented in India. And that is the story of this business. I do not know whether there are any 
uh, people who would like to ask questions or the like, they're welcome to do so. Is there anyone? If you would like to ask a question, be sure to unmute your mic. I would like to ask a question. Can you hear me? Yes, um, yeah, can. about the third or fourth, maybe the fifth slide was a real clear picture of India and it is how it's partitioned and countries around it. Could you repeat that slide? I can try. I think I can try. I can I make it work. The back and forward arrow keys to quickly go between slides. Yeah. Uh, Do you see at the bottom of your screen? There's also yeah. I think around 200 there's, slides. So jump into the beginning might take a minute. It would be about yeah. the fourth or fifth slide, the very beginning. Okay. Can I get up here? I can help you to do that. Let me just come back in. Well, I was going to try the, the uh, end of slideshow. So, we're going to want to just scroll up on your, here, let me oh. have this for just a second. So, the person asking the question, you said it was about the fifth slide? About, it's a yes. picture of Indian, how it's divided. A okay. map. Okay. That should be it, right, about there. That one. Which one? That one. This one right here? No, this one. Number seven. Yeah. Okay. Can we that, all see that? That looked like it. No, I don't see it yet. Okay. We need sharing. to share his screen. Oh, share. Is that what you did? We're almost there. Here we go. Now, can you see it? Uh. Yeah, yeah, way enlarge it. There you go. Yeah, that was the one. Okay. Uh, go ahead. You want to do? Can I make it even larger? Yeah. The it was button at the top. There's a tab about six tabs over called slideshow. Oh, that works too. Yeah. Play from start. Well. You want well, to do the one next to it. Yep. Perfect. Uh, Thanks, Leo. Okay. Uh, now, is, is it pictured? Okay. Yep. What was the question? The question had something to do with the various countries besides it. I just want to see it again because I wanted to look at it good. Oh, I see it. Ah. Uh, yeah, if you were in class, and normally, the, this class, by the way, was all prepared for March. <laughs> and uh, I had to kind of redo it, and thank you, because I was looking for people to react out of the class. And uh, you would have had a map like this handed to you. And then you would have been able to see what we were talking about as we went along. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? I'm gonna go back. Okay. Monitor from my computer. All right. Did I quit in time? Oh yeah, it's it's it was an hour and a half, wasn't it? I, I have a question. Um, with such an extensive coastline, uh, does India have a uh, real naval tradition? 
I do not know, but maybe someone in the uh, group can answer that. I do not know of their naval uh, tradition insofar as when they were under the British, <coughs> they, uh, the British took care of the Navy. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. <coughs> Does anybody have any other questions? Such or comments or remarks that you've been there and have some stories. Would you would you be able to send any important uh, images on your next for the next class to us? To send them, well, they're all. On like you did with the uh, quiz. Oh, I see. You mean like a map or something on that? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would be up to Kim and, Su and Susan whether they can do that. I okay. Can, I can give them copies. Thank you. I think we could certainly send the images uh, that you feel are important, Jerry. That would have been interesting to send one like this. And I think there was another couple others that was like this one here. It's not too bad either. A little idea of what's going on. Mm. That would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and next time, of course, we'll be talking about, well, we'll be going right on around. Can you see this map that I'm showing now? Uh, We'll be here in Pakistan, not Afghanistan, but Pakistan, and right on down uh, through Nepal and Bhutan and Bangladesh. Those two are uh, rather important. And then, of course, Sri Lanka and the Maldives, which are almost underwater, <laughs> very low in, as far as sea level is concerned. So that's next week. Well, we want to thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Um, I certainly appreciate everyone's patience at the beginning of the presentation. And we look forward to going over the rest of the material next week. So um, everybody have a wonderful day. And thank you very much, Jerry. We appreciate it. Well, thank you for listening. Give them a round of applause. Yay. Thank you. See you next time. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. We got a week down here. But yeah, but I want to. Oh. Well, we made it through.